Hello, everyone. Welcome to this fourth day of the APM webinar uh, for the December 2020 examination session. Uh, this is Lokman Rafiq, tutor for the paper APM. Uh, we have had good uh, four or five days, uh, the three days of this specific webinar. And uh, what we would be doing now is we are now heading into the fourth day of this specific webinar. Uh, what I'll be doing is I will be I will be going through the various areas with the uh, which which are important from the perspective of the exam in today's session. Uh, so let me actually um, let me actually uh, share a few things with you. Uh, I am assuming that a lot of you people have already got the handouts uh, either through the email or through the WhatsApp groups and uh, that. You people have already gotten those things. So what we would be doing in today's session is going to be uh, we will be going through the uh, economic value added. We will be going through the divisionalization uh, area. And in addition to the divisionalization area, uh, what we would also be doing is we would be going through a few of the exam practice questions on this area also. So let me let me share this. Uh, in fact, I think uh, there are many handouts which are already available. So you could uh, probably uh, have a look at this specific uh, handout, uh, which is pertaining to value based management, uh, which is pertaining to the economic value added, which is pertaining to another part of the economic value added article that the examiner had published some time back. Okay, now let me know that how many of you have already studied this uh, economic value added? How many of you have already studied the economic value added? How many of you are comfortable with the economic value added technique? Yeah, how many of you have already studied the economic value added? How many of you are comfortable with the economic value added technique? Okay. Studied but not sound grip. Studied but not comfortable. Okay. Now, great. Uh, so, what I'm going to do is that I'm going through this uh, specific economic value added technique. Uh, I'll teach you this specific economic value added technique in such a manner, assuming that you haven't studied it. So, that's what I'll be doing. Now, let me start off. Uh, the first thing is, let me guide you that the topic that uh, of the economic value added that we are going to be discussing. Uh, there are a few things that you would have to keep in mind with respect to the economic value added. And what exactly are those things? First of all, So if I if I talk to you about this economic value added, um, I'm assuming that uh, all of you do remember that we have got two of the performance measures which are used a lot with respect to the divisional structure. And uh, what exactly are those two performance indicators that are used a lot with respect to divisional structure? Those performance indicators are termed as uh, residual value. And those performance indicators are termed as uh, this return on investment. So 
if I could just quickly recall the formula for the return on investment, and if I could quickly recall the formula for the residual income, so we can have a better discussion on the economic value added because the concept of the economic value added is actually connected with this specific uh, residual value. Added.
testing one two three i hope that i am audible now is is it am i audible now yeah am i audible now yeah am i audible now okay okay uh, good enough uh, alhamdulillah now uh, coming back to it um so unfortunately um i had to switch my pc uh, i don't know what happened that the sound all of a sudden uh, was lost but anyways let's actually start discussing further so i am going to start from the scratch because i know i'm assuming that uh, there was a lot of disturbance which would have made it uh, very difficult uh, to uh, understand so i'm going to start from the scratch okay now the topic that i'm going to start off the name of the topic is economic value added uh, let's talk about the concept of economic value added let's talk about the concept of economic value added um the background to the economic value added is we have a formula for the economic value added and the formula for the economic value added is no pat which is the net operating profit after tax less the weighted average cost of capital multiplied by the capital employed the weighted average cost of capital multiplied by the capital employed now let's just start discussing this so what exactly is the formula for the economic value added the formula for the economic value added is it's no pat the net operating profit after tax less vac into capital employed now when we talk about this no pat so this no pat is actually net operating profit after tax it's net operating profit after tax and the vac is your weighted average cost of capital the vac is your weighted average cost of capital and then you've got this capital employed uh, which is simply the uh, total assets minus current liability or you could do it like this which is the equity plus non current liability that is all going to be considered as your weighted average cost of capital now let's talk and let's discuss further so the first thing that we need to understand is basically that this is the formula for the economic value added now if this is the formula for the economic value added what was the reason behind introducing this formula what are the components of this specific formula how do we establish no pat how do we establish the vac how do we establish the capital employed let's have a quick discussion about all this the first thing that you need to keep in mind is basically um that uh, there are various performance measures and uh, amongst the various performance measures uh, there were one of the performance measure which was quite famous amongst the entity and that performance measure is termed as a residual in amongst the various performance measures there was one of the performance measures which was quite famous amongst the users and that was actually the residual income now what exactly do you mean by this concept of residual income the formula for the residual income since the residual income was majorly used for the division so the formula for the residual income is the divisional profit the formula for the residual income is the divisional profit and from the divisional profit what you do is that you say that there is basically the investment multiplied by desired return multiplied by desired return now so for example if you have got a if you have got a division which has got a profit of let's say 100000 and you have invested let's say 500000 into that specific division So if you have invested five hundred thousand into that specific division, and your desired return is twelve percent, 
So resultingly, what happens is it's going to be hundred thousand less five hundred thousand into twelve gives you sixty thousand. So hence, this is going to be forty thousand. So this specific measure of the residual income was a very common and a very famous performance measures amongst the various performance management analysts. But when we talk about this specific measure, which is the residual income measure, there are multiple problems with respect to this residual income measure. What are those multiple problems with the residual income measure? We are going to discuss them one by one. First of all, this residual income of 40,000 tells you what? If there is a positive residual income, that means the business has generated uh, the returns exceed the desired return the returns exceed the desired return that's what it is the second thing is if there is a zero residual income this would mean the returns equal desired return and the third one of them is basically if this is negative that means the returns are less than the desired return. So when we talk about the residual income as a performance measure, so with respect to the residual income, what actually happens is, let me repeat, when we talk about the residual income as a performance measure, so generally speaking, what happens is that if your residual income is either positive or is residual income either zero, so you would say that the division or the segment or the branch is performing well. But if it is negative, but if it is negative, then you would say that it's not performing well. If it's negative, then you would say that it's not performing well at all. Now let's move a bit forward and let's discuss a bit further. Now, um, so first of all, how do you interpret the residual income? We talked about it. Uh, how do we interpret the residual income? We talked about it. The next aspect is basically to be able to understand. Let me repeat. The next aspect is that we should be able to understand that uh, what exactly were the components of the residual income. So when you talk about the residual income's component, one of them is basically a divisional profit. Now, the problem that used to arise with respect to this divisional profit was that the divisional profit is made up of many non-cash items and if you are evaluating the performance of the business using the non-cash items let me repeat if you are evaluating the performance of the business using the non-cash items then automatically what is actually going to happen is let's try to have an understanding that if you are evaluating the performance of the business using the non-cash items, then what is actually going to happen is that is going to give you an incorrect picture of how the business is performing. That is going to give you an incorrect picture of how the business is performing. Okay, now the next thing is basically, so uh, this was one of the problems with respect to the divisional profit, that the divisional profit is actually one of those measures that actually includes the non-cash items. Now, um, the next, another thing that was actually there was basically that when it comes to the computation of the residual income you incorporate the desired return now basically what happens is the desired return of the management could be anything let me repeat the desired return of the management could be 20 percent could be 25 percent could be 30 percent could be 40 percent that's what the desired return of the management is going to be let me repeat 
The desired return of the management could be anything, 20%, 25%, 30%, 40%. But it's not necessary that the desired return that the management is a realistic return. It's not necessary that the desired return of the management is a realistic return. So basically, in order to overcome this specific issue, what was actually introduced was the EVA introduces the concept of using the VAC. Because you see, the VAC, it's a reflection of the capital employed. It's a reflection of the investor or it's a reflection of the providers of finance. So the return that is actually desired by the providers of finance, that is reflected through the VAC. So it's going to be better off that the entity uses VAC instead of the desired returns and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So in order to overcome the overcome the limitations that are being available with respect to this residual income, the concept of the economic value added was introduced. And the formula for the economic value added is this, which is the no pat, the net operating profit after tax, less the VAC into capital employed. Why exactly was this specific formula introduced? This specific formula was introduced with a purpose, with an objective. And what was the objective? To overcome the limitations of the residual income as a performance measurement tool of any specific organization. So is everyone okay till now? Yeah, is everyone okay till now? Okay, the economic value was introduced in order to overcome the limitations of residual income. What were the limitations of residual income? The limitations of residual income were basically that first of all, there was this divisional profit that was being used. When the divisional profit is being used, so what actually happens with respect to the divisional profit is that, let me repeat, what happens with respect to the divisional profit is that, What happens with respect to the divisional profit is that um, basically divisional profits include non-cash items also. And if you incorporate the non-cash items also, then what happens is the incorporation of the non-cash item would actually mean what would actually mean that the that the profit appropriate that the that the calculation for the profit that the uh, that the calculation of the that the calculation of this uh, excess profit is not an appropriate one. Similarly. Uh, here there was a use of desired return. The desired return could be the desired return could be anything which could be unrealistic. So it's better off that you use the weighted average cost of capital instead of the desired return. So for this specific reason, for keeping this specific thing in mind, the concept of the economic value added was introduced. The concept of economic value added was introduced. Now, let's move a bit forward and discuss further. If I move a bit forward, let's uh, discuss that how exactly do we calculate the NOPAT. Let's discuss that how exactly do we calculate the NOPAT, how exactly do we establish the capital employed and how exactly uh, is this whole calculated. Now, if I'm going to calculate the no pad, what actually happens is that uh, there is a specific method for the computation of no pad. Now, what exactly is that? Let me write it down. And then we are going to move a bit forward.
Okay, so let's talk about this notepad now. Um, okay, now uh, Rami, do you have a question that why exactly are we using the weighted average cost of capital? So we're using the weighted average cost of capital because we're using the weighted average cost of capital because what actually happens is that weighted average cost of capital reflects the actual weighted average cost of capital reflects the actual uh, return which is desired by the providers of finance. Now, how exactly do we calculate the NOPAT? Let's try to have a discussion of the NOPAT. So what we do is that we start off with either the operating profit which is also the profit before interest and tax after that what we do is that we incorporate the adjustments to it now what exactly are the adjustments that we incorporate so let's try to have an understanding of this we apply tax <clears throat> okay um so i have actually written the computation of the notepad in front of you the notepad actually means the net operating profit after tax. And when it's net operating profit after tax, let's try to have an understanding that how do we calculate this notepad for the purposes of the computation of, for the purposes of the computation of the economic value added, for the purposes of computation of economic value added. Now, um, there is one more adjustment that I would probably do and that's actually that's actually the operating lease rentals and depreciation on assets okay so This is increase, decrease in provision. Now let's try to discuss. First of all, 
let's keep in this mind that you are trying to establish no pad and the concept of establishing no pad is that the no pad is majorly a cash figure the concept of establishing no pad is that the no pad is actually a cash figure now when we talk about the no pad being the cash figure so is it actually a cash figure the answer is no it's a sort of an economic profit that we are trying to establish it's a sort of an economic profit that we are trying to establish now how does it go about so the starting point is the pbit the profit before interest and tax assume that you've got a profit before interest and tax of 400000 what you're going to do is that you're going to apply the tax rate let's say 20% is the 25% is the tax rate so you directly apply the tax rate onto it so if 400000 into 25% this actually gives you 100000 this 300000 figure is going to be named as pbit this is going to be named as pbit 1 minus p what is this going to be named as pbit 1 minus p so how do we start calculating it we say that operating profit okay then what you need to do is that you need to deduct the taxation you need to directly apply taxation to it how much uh, whatever the tax rate is you apply the tax then what happens is you end up getting pbit 1 minus p now let's move a bit forward the next thing that we do is that we add back few things we add back accounting depreciation why because the accounting depreciation is a non-cash expense the accounting depreciation is a non-cash expense so let's say that is the accounting depreciation is 150,000. it has already been deducted from this profit so you need to add back the accounting depreciation you need to add back the accounting depreciation now uh, there is somebody john Mupa, you are asking that is there an adjustment on interest i'll tell you don't worry there's another one tory called byron uh, what is eligible for capitalization what is eligible for okay just wait a bit now so um let me let me go through each and every part and then you can ask whatever questions that you may have so i said that you start off with an operating profit let's say whatever that is you apply taxation to it resultingly what happens is the accounting depreciation is established and then what happens is there is a concept of economic depreciation what exactly do you mean by economic depreciation try to understand this when we when we talk about the asset so there is there are actually two types of life of an asset one of them is a useful life and the other one of them is termed as an economic life let me discuss one of them is a useful life the other one of them is an economic life now when we are going to be calculating this useful life the useful life and the economic life the major difference is the economic life is the maximum period over which asset will provide benefit over which asset will provide benefit that is considered to be economic life and the useful life is the period over which an entity intends to take benefit there are two things one of them is a useful life the other one of them is an economic life if i talk about the useful life it's a period over in over which an entity intends to take the benefit and the economic life is the maximum period over which an asset can give you benefit like for example if I talk about the useful in the economic life example, an asset may give you benefit for 10 years. But as an entity, you may have a policy of using it for four years only. So if as an entity, you have a policy of using it for four years only, so that means the useful life is four years. Now, let's try to understand this. The accounting depreciation, the accounting depreciation is established over useful life that means if the asset is was 100,000, if the useful life was four years, so the accounting depreciation is of 25,000. But if we try to calculate 
if we try to calculate the economic uh, depreciation of that asset we are going to say 100000 divided by 10 so 10000 becomes the economic depreciation of that asset now so the proponents of eva the people who introduced eva their viewpoint was i am repeating the people who introduced eva their viewpoint was that 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 the asset when you use that asset, realistically speaking, the value of the asset declines over its economic life. It does not decline over its useful life. So therefore, what actually happens is you should deduct the accounting, you should add back the accounting depreciation, but whatever the economic depreciation, that means the depreciation computed over the economic life that needs to be deducted. Why? Because that's a real consumption of the asset. The next thing is you need to you need to add back all the non-cash expenses. I may have mentioned only few non-cash expenses. You may think of other non-cash expenses also. Whatever the impairment is there, whatever the impairment is there, that impairment is non-cash expense. Whatever the increase or decrease in provision for bad debts, again, that is considered to be a non-cash item. Defer tax again is a non cash item because the defer tax is never settled. It's just a double entry that moves it. So, if you've got a defer tax, let's say 50,000 is the defer tax, so you will have to add it up. Now, what next is there? Let's discuss further. You've got the PBIT 1 minus T. The accounting debris needs to be added back. The economic debris needs to be deducted. The non cash expenses needs to be added. Then there is something which is eligible for capitalization. Let's try to discuss this. You see what happens is when we are dealing with the intangibles in accordance with IS 38, usually what we do is that we expense out a lot of things. For example, the research cost, for example, the internally generated customer list, internally generated brand, we don't capitalize them. But the proponents of the economic value added, their viewpoint was, their viewpoint was that, that if you have got R&D cost, which is going to give you benefits for more than 12 months, which is going to give you benefits for more than 12 months, then what should happen is it needs to be added back. Because it is not going to be considered as an expense it's rather going to be considered as an asset it's rather going to be considered as an asset <laughs> okay, let's move a bit forward and discuss further. The next thing is okay. The next thing is basically um, operating lease rentals. Now, what exactly do you mean by operating lease rentals? Let's try to have a discussion. When we talk about the operating lease rentals, let's try to understand, let's try to see this. The, the, the people who actually, uh, who talked about this uh, economic value added, 
their viewpoint about this operating lease was their viewpoint about the operating lease was that they actually mentioned this thing that see even if you are using a property and that property is actually on rent if they are using a property and that property is actually on rent then what actually happens is if the property is on rent this means that although you may be paying only 200000 for the property but realistically speaking if this property is worth 20 million so you are taking the advantage of 20 million from it so if you are taking advantage of 20 million from it therefore this property should be capitalized as part and parcel of your asset now try to understand this although the new ifrs which is ifrs 16 talks about this let me repeat the new ifrs which is ifrs 16 talks about this so if the ifrs 16 talks about this specific area then what actually happens is then what actually happens is if ifrs 16 is talking about this specific area what is this going to mean what is it going to mean this is actually mean that from the for the current circumstances if an entity is applying ifrs 16 then whether an asset is an operating lease whether an asset is on finance lease it's always going to be capitalized but but if we talk about the old scenarios and you might come across any of the old scenarios you need to understand that if you have an asset which is worth 20 million and you are only paying a rental of 200,000, then ideally what happens is this should be treated as your capital employed. And if it is treated as your capital employed, so the rental expense should not be deducted. So therefore, whatever the operating cost rentals, they need to be added back. Let's say if this is 300,000, this needs to be added back. But yes, this asset on operating lease, their depreciation needs to be deducted because we are treating it as our own asset. And what sort of depreciation? The economics type of a depreciation. So when you talk about the computation of NOPAT, this is what, this is how you calculate NOPAT. This is how you establish NOPAT. How? The operating profit, you start off with the operating profit, you reach this specific level. So if anyone is having any questions pertaining to it, anyone is having any issues with respect to it, do let me know. Are you able to understand the NOPAT calculations? If you have any queries pertaining to the NOPAT calculation, then let me know. Yes, I'm just waiting for your uh, questions. I, there is going to be volume, just wait. I'm waiting for the questions of you people.
uh, okay so now uh, we've got multiple questions i was just waiting for the question so that i could figure out that what are the different types of questions that you are having now let's just see uh the first thing is now there is one of the queries which is there is one of the queries which is basically pertaining to um one of the queries which is pertaining to uh, the interest computation with respect to the notepad so i need to get back to you okay just wait a okay so okay let me get back now the last depreciation is for what the last depreciation is for the asset which is on operating lease interest calculation issue okay just wait please re-explain operating lease rentals okay i'm going to explain uh how why non-cash items are added with profit okay is depreciation of lease asset yes depreciation of lease asset how to deal with it always find trouble and okay don't worry i'm just going to come on to the question bit of confusion about can you explain why okay now let's get back i think everybody is okay till now with respect to accounting depreciation with respect to the economic depreciation everybody gets it the non-cash expenses are added back because we try to calculate economic profit the realistic profit we try to calculate the economic profit which is the realistic profit now so basically what happens is if this is an economic profit which is a realistic profit what is this going to mean what is this going to mean um so this is actually going to mean that um this is actually going to mean that we are trying to incorporate whatever the realistic expenses are that's why we added back the accounting depreciation but we deducted the economic depreciation we add back the non cash expenses we added back them now the amount eligible for capitalization although accounting standard says it should not be capitalized but we are capitalizing it accounting standard says we should not capitalize but we are capitalizing it now so if we are going to be capitalizing it now what next is there the next situation is that uh, uh, we are going to be capitalizing it because uh, we believe that if the r d can give you benefit for more than 12 months then it should be capitalized for the operating lease renters try to understand this thing you do know that operating lease means that the asset is not owned by us it means just the normal rental agreement so the proponents of this uh, economic value added their viewpoint is that you are using this property and you are only paying 200 dollars but you are taking the benefit of the 20 million property so if you are taking the benefit of 20 million property what does that mean what does that mean this would actually mean that um this would actually mean that realistically speaking you have a 20 million of the asset at your disposal so you should add up this asset as your asset and your capital employed and this property the rental should be avoided just like if it's as your own property and you should rather deduct the economic depreciation as if it's your own property so the operating lease rentals should not be claimed rather the depreciation on the operating lease asset should be claimed because we are treating it as if it's owned by us now there is another question what's the depreciation on uh, uh, asset and the i mean you see i told you there are two types of depreciation one of them is used to accounting depreciation the other one of them is an economic depreciation the accounting depreciation is when you depreciate over useful life the economic depreciation is when you depreciate over the economic life that's what the economic depreciation is okay now is everyone okay with all the queries pertaining to the notepad calculation there is one more pertaining to interest which i need to explain 
so don't worry i'll just explain the interest also but are you people okay Okay, let's move a bit forward and discuss further. Okay, uh, Timothy, you are answering, you are asking a question that what's the difference between the accounting depreciation and the depreciation on assets? Okay, let me let me say this thing. Economic depreciation on assets under operating lease. Economic depreciation on asset under operating lease. Okay, let's move a bit forward and discuss further. Um, the next aspect of this specific EVA computation is the calculation of capital employed. The next aspect of the EVA calculation is the capital employed. Now, what exactly do you mean by the capital employed? There is a very important thing which you need to understand that there are two capital employed. One of them is the opening capital employed the other one of them is a closing capital employed. So remember for the economic value added calculation, it's the opening capital employed that's going to be used. I repeat, for the computation of the economic value added, it's the opening capital employed that's going to be used. Now, if I talk about the opening capital employed, what does that mean? This would actually mean that if you are calculating the EVA for the year ended 31st December 2020, that means you would actually be needing the capital as at 1st January 2020 or as at 31st December 2019. So you would have to keep this thing in mind. Now, how do we establish the capital employed? So you need to understand that. Um, the capital employed is calculated using multiple methods, multiple manners. Okay, I'll repeat. I'll repeat, I told you people that if you have to use the capital employed, what capital employed would you be using? Opening, closing, average, what? So you'll be using opening capital employed. Like if you are calculating EVA for the year ended 31st December 2020. If you are calculating EVA for the year ended 31st December 2020. That means what is actually going to happen is uh, you will be using the you'll be using the capital employed for the opening. Opening means 1st January 2020. And this also means 31st December 19. So if the examiner gives you 31st December 19 capital, you will be using that. Okay, now, so first of all, let's try to understand how do we calculate the capital employed. One of the formula for the capital employed is you calculate the equity plus the non-current liability. The other way of calculating the capital employed is total assets minus current liability. So these are the two ways, these are the two methods of establishing the capital employed, which is the equity plus non-current liability. And the other one of them is total assets less current liability. Now, 
let's move a bit forward let's discuss further so what you need to do is that you need to use you need to calculate the adjusted capital employed now what exactly do you mean by this adjusted capital employed for the eva calculation the adjusted capital employed means that capital as per the balance sheet then what would happen is you would say accounting depreciation to date to date is from the day when the entity has started operation economic depreciation to date the economic depreciation to date that is from the date the entity has started operation then what happens is the intangible cost expense needs to be added back the provisions non cash expenses to date and then what you are going to do is that fair value of the asset held under operating lease fair value of the asset held under operating lease fair value of the asset held under operating lease now let's try to have an understanding that how exactly do we calculate all this so it's basically if you are trying to calculate if you are trying to perform the calculation for the year ended let's say 31st december 2020 that means you are calculating eva for the time period 1st january 2020 to 31st december 2020 now so that means we are using this capital and i told you this is equal to 31st december 19 capital also is that okay so the adjustment that we are doing is we are doing adjustment to this capital and if we are doing adjustment to this capital this would actually mean that we are doing adjustment for all the periods up till here that means we are doing adjustment for all the that means we are actually adjusting all of these things which have happened for this period yeah is that okay to everyone is everyone okay with this are you people okay with the computation of the adjusted capital employed are you people okay yes the adjusted capital employed shall be up till 31st may 2019 31st december 2019 
Yeah, is that okay to everyone? Okay, when I talk about the intangibles, you see what happens is there are many expenditures like R&D, the research cost, etc., etc., which are generally expensed out. But I told you that if it is expected to give you benefit for more than 12 months, that means you don't have to treat it as an expense. If you are not going to be treating it as an expense, then you need to add it up to the capital employed also. Then you need to add it up to the capital employed also. Okay, now. Yeah, it's a corresponding adjustment. Okay, great. I think uh, every one of you is now able to understand how we establish the economic value added. So you've got the handouts. And from the handouts, what you could do is that you could access the questions. And uh, the question that I'm going to be using are, uh, one of them is the question name is still water services. So we're going to be using this question, the name of which is still water services. I think you people have the access to this question. Kindly open up this question and we'll share a start discussion. Okay, don't worry about this specific uh, issue of uh, tax. I'm just going to explain to you. Don't worry, we'll cover up this thing in this question. Now, we have got this question is still water services. There are multiple things with respect to the still water services. There are two requirements majorly. One of them is evaluate the performance of a still water services using EVA. One of the requirement is you have to evaluate the performance of still water services using EVA. Now that's the one thing. The second thing is assess whether still water services meet its regulatory ROC target. So we are going to come on to that a bit later. But for the time being, the first thing that we need to cover up is basically um, still water services. The first thing is we need to cover up with the still water services using EVA. So what does this mean? This means you have to calculate EVA and then you have to comment whether the, whether the entity's performance is good or whether the entity's performance is bad. That's what you have to do. So now let's just try to calculate the EVA. I'm giving you five, seven minutes. So you take this reading time and try to calculate EVA. So you've got the question time. Till this 5.17 p.m., uh, kindly go through the question and then we'll start discussing.
Okay, so let's just start off. Let's just start discussing about this specific question now. First thing is, we have to calculate the economic value added. We have to evaluate the performance using the economic value added. Now, now let's talk, let's discuss. <clears throat> Basically, it says that still water services has got this revenue, which is 345 million, has got the operating cost, which is 277. So it has got the operating profit, which is 68. What is it? The operating profit, which is 68. And then there is this finance cost, which is 23. So resultingly, the profit before tax of 45 is there. The tax at the rate of 25% is this 9.5. And then the profit after tax is this 35.5. Now, um, you see, I told you people that when we are going to be calculating the NOPAT, you can start off with the operating profit. And from the operating profit, what you could do is that, let's say if you've got an operating profit of 1,000, you've got an operating profit of 1,000, and you apply tax at the rate of 25% to it, so it's actually going to be 250. Resultingly, it's going to be PBIT 1 minus P. Now, the alternative way of doing it is what? For example, for example, you've got a PBIT of, let's say, 1,000, and you've got interest of, let's say, 200. So resultingly, the profit before tax turns out to be 800. And you apply tax to it at, let's say, 25%. So it actually becomes, what, 200? And hence, what happens is you've got the profit after tax of 600. So if I have to start calculating the NOPAT, I'm repeating, if I have to start calculating the NOPAT, I've got another way of doing it, which is I can start off with a PAT of 600. And what I could do is that I could add up the after tax interest. I could add up after tax interest. The after tax interest that I need to add up is basically going to be what? It's going to be 200 multiplied. 1 minus t so 1 minus 0.25 so this is actually going to be 150 and hence you would again be standing at you would again be standing at what you would again be standing at this pbit 1 minus t. you would again be standing at pbit 1 minus t. is that okay to you yeah is that okay to you Okay, now. Now, let's talk. So we have got this operating profit. So you see, you've got these two options. Either you can do it this way or you can do it this way. But make sure that the, that this tax has to be all the cash expense. If there is any non-cash portion of the tax, then that needs to be adjusted. You have been given the capital employed from the published account 2012, 2011, both 36, 37, etc. Now let's talk about each one of them. So we are being told about the operating cost. I'll read through the question, then I'll attempt. We have been given the operating cost, which is depreciation, provision for bed debt, R&D, and other non-cash items. 
we are being given economic depreciation and we see is that economic depreciation only includes any appropriate amortization adjustment it says in previous years it can be assumed that the economic and the accounting depreciation were the same what does this line means this line actually means that if you are going to be calculating the opening capital so you need to keep this thing in mind that the accounting depreciation to date that the accounting depreciation to date and the economic depreciation to date when you would add up this and you would deduct this the resultingly what happens is if this is 1000 then this is also 1000 so hence what happens is there is going to be no impact of it that may be there is going to be no impact of it. is that okay to you people now let's move let's discuss further now um the next thing is it says tax is the cash paid in the current year 9 million and an adjustment of 0.5 million for deferred tax so we are not going to be considering the deferred tax why the reason being there is no point in considering the deferred tax because it's a non cash item it says there was no deferred tax balance prior to 2012 further the provision for doubtful debt was 4.5 million on the 2012 balance sheet so we need to see what was the opening provision for doubtful debt we'll consider this now rnd is not capitalized in the accounts okay it relates to new development that will be developed over 5 year and is expected to be a long term benefit to the company 2012 is the first year of this project cost of capital gearing etc etc now before i start attempting this question of still water services there are few things that we need to understand what are those few things that you need to understand try to understand this there is actually going to be no part less vac multiply by capital employed so when we are going to be calculating when we are going to be talking about the no pack sorry when we are going to be calculating the vac we need to keep this thing in mind that what is the vac going to be we have been given the cost of capital of ss equity and the debt the gearing and the debt so the vac is cost of equity multiplied by market value of equity divided by market value of equity plus market value of debt Plus KD one minus T multiplied by D upon E plus. So hence, resulting in what happens is we now know this thing which is sixteen percent multiplied. The market value of equity is point four divided by point four plus point six plus. the cost of debt pre tax pre tax that means this is before tax 5% will multiply it by what is the tax rate 25% so it has to be 1 minus t so it multiplied by 0.75 and then multiply by 0.6 divided by 0.4 plus 0.6 so can somebody please calculate the vac can somebody please revert back with the value of vac Yeah, can somebody please confirm to me what the value of the vac?
8.4 okay i am getting very different answer i cannot decide on any one you people are uh, calculating every one of you is calculating a different answer Okay, I've got two answers. Uh, no, no, no. In fact, no, none of the answer is matching. Uh, please do the calculation, please. Okay, yes, I've now got two of the answers uh, which are matching, which is 8.65%. So I would rather consider it to be 8.7% to make things easy for myself. So we have got the weighted average cost of capital as 8.7%. How much is it? 8.7%. Now, the next thing with respect to this question is that you have to, uh, why did I calculate this? I calculated this just to make sure. I'm repeating it again. I have calculated this just to make sure that I'm able to get maximum marks by doing the easy calculations. Let me repeat, I calculated it just to ensure that I got the easy marks by uh, doing simple calculations. Now let's move a bit forward and discuss further. What next is there, the next situation is, it's actually like this. Um, you have to calculate the NOPAT. For the NOPAT, you can start off with the operating profit the operating profit is given to us, which is 68. The operating profit is given to us, which is 68. 68 is the operating profit. You could simply perform the adjustments. We have got the finance charges here. Now what happens is when you claim the finance charges, When you claim the finance cost, so what happens is there is actually going to be a tax savings due to interest that you would have to consider. What is that tax saving due to interest? That tax saving due to interest is going to be 23 multiplied by 25%. That's actually going to be 23 multiplied by 25%. less the tax saving due to interest how would we calculate it we would simply say 23 multiplied by 25 percent so this actually gives you 5.75 the next thing is we have got the taxation here it's 9.5 but you would only deduct the tax paid which is nine why because 9.5 includes 0.5 which is a non-tax non-cash expense then what happens is uh if i go on calculating the operating costs and so and so i'll use this column i've got the add back amounts 
of accounting depreciation which is 59 i've got the add back amount for the provision for bed debt which is going to be 2 i've got the research and development which is going to be 12 i've got the other non cash items which is going to be 7 they're going to add up all of them then you've got the economic depreciation So you would deduct the economic depreciation of 83. The tax paid is okay. Uh, the provision we considered, this we considered okay. So resultingly, what you would have is you would end up getting the no pad. What do you do that? You would end up getting the no pad. So how much is this no pad going to be? Let's try to calculate. Let's try to establish. You will end up getting the no pad. 68 less 5.75 less 9 add 59 add 2 add 12 add 7 less 83 can somebody please confirm the value yeah can somebody please confirm the value thank you my muhammad kayum thank you very much it's going to be 50.25 going to be 50.25 is that okay now okay now what next is there let's try to understand the next thing is Okay, you see, you don't take Mr. Um, uh, I don't know if you are uh, male or female. I just say Amrita Otal. Uh, what actually happens is uh, you have to you have to consider what has been what has been included in the profit calculation. And when it comes to the profit calculation, the amount that has been included has been uh, two million. Okay, now let's move, let's discuss further. So we have got the no pad. Now what we need to do is that we need to calculate the adjusted capital employee. So if I'm going to be calculating the adjusted capital employed, how am I going to do it? Let's just see. For me to be able to calculate the adjusted capital employed, I would say, that uh, first of all as per the balance sheet this is 2011 capital that i'm going to adjust why because we adjust the opening capital so it's actually 637 how much is it 637 now what next is there you need to incorporate the adjustments what do you need to do you need to incorporate the adjustments. What are the adjustments that you need to incorporate? That's actually, let's just think about it. Let's just talk about it. First of all, for the accounting depreciation and for the economic depreciation, there is no adjustment that you have to make because 
they were equal to each other in the past then what happened is we need to work for the provision for bad debt so whatever the opening provision for bad debt we need to consider that for the provision for bad debt the opening figure we don't know the expense for the year we do know it's true the closing balance are we being told about the closing balance i think yes it was 4.5 so hence what happens is this is the balancing figure which is going to be 2.5 so this was what it was at 30th september 2011 is everyone okay with this so what i am going to do is that i am going to say the provision of 2.5 needs to be added now the next thing is research and development just ignore it other non cash items the last year the non cash items which were incurred in previously needs to be added back then you have got this r and d which is arises arising in the current year so we need to ignore it and hence resultingly you get this capital employed and adjusted calculation how much is it going to be 645.5 how much is it going to be 645.5 now let's try to have an understanding okay now next the next situation is with respect to the next situation you now need to establish the economic value added so we have got the no pad which is 50.25 less the vac which is 8.7 multiply by 645.5 so how much do we have we have got 645.5 multiply by 8.7% this is something like negative how much is it this is negative 5.90 now so we have established the eva to be negative 5.90 and if the examiner is asking us if the examiner is asking us to establish evaluate the performance using eva so evaluating of the performance would mean that the first thing is we need to calculate it and then we need to comment on it now what exactly is going to be the comment the comment is going to be that when we are going to talk about the comment the comment on it is going to be that uh, the performance has been bad the value has declined 
because a negative EVA would mean that the value has declined. The value has declined. Is that okay to everyone? Yeah, is everyone okay with the calculation? I hope you would have gotten some confidence after doing the calculation as of now. Okay, this is great. So we did this question, which was about the economic value added. There is another requirement to the question, which I'm not going to be considering right now, because my focus has been that I should talk about the EVA computation and et cetera, et cetera. Yes, Kayum, don't worry about it. Um, now i have shared with you people i have shared with you people few of the articles on the economic value added there is this part one of the article which covers up the eva calculation you can go through it just for the sake of going through it there is part two of the article which has to be read by every one of you because it covers the theoretical aspect of the EVA. I'm repeating it covers the theoretical aspect of the EVA. So you should be going through it. You should be going through it because it covers disadvantages, advantages, etc. etc. You should be going through it. And then there is another article which is about value-based management, which I'm going to cover up in a bit, which I'm going to cover up in a while. So don't worry about it. But you have to make sure that this is something that you should be going through. Now, let's move a bit forward. Let's talk a bit further. So we have gone through one of the questions on the economic value added. What have we done? We have talked about the economic value added. Uh, Muhammad Hassan Ali Khan, your question, the all the adjustment for capital employed is done for previous year. Yes, nothing from current year. No, um, Maaz Ali, you are saying we come cross with the terminology shareholder value creation. That is RI, ROC does not measure value for shareholders while EVA does. Yes, yes, you are right. You are right. I mean, because EVA is a better measure of establishing the, uh, I mean, you see, if residual income is positive, we assume that the return achieved is over and above the return desired by the provider of finance, all the investors. But for the EVA, you're using VAC, you're using the realistic economic profit. So EVA is a better measure telling you that whether the value has been added or not. So if you are going to take decision with respect to EVA, always remember if the EVA is positive, that means the value has been created. If the EVA has been zero, no value created. If the EVA is negative, so that means the value has been destroyed or the value has been deteriorated. That's what you need to keep in mind with respect to the EVA computation. Is that fine now? Okay, great. Now. Let's move forward. You have got another question in hand. And uh, the name of that question is Totac Company. The name of that question is Totac Company.
okay um and what i would be doing is i would be i'd be taking a short break for the prayers so the time which is the pakistan time right now is 5:50 pm so i'll take the break till 6:05 pm i'll take the break till Six zero five p.m. So let's meet after break.
Okay, now let's talk about this question. <clears throat> the name of which is Totag Company. There are two aspects that are being covered with respect to this question, Totag Company. Uh, what exactly are they? One of them is about value based management, and the other one of them is about EVA. So, the first requirement is advise the director on the implementation of a step two of VBM as requested. Okay. The second is evaluate both whether Totag has created value and the difficulties of using EVA as a performance indicator. Now, what exactly are we going to be doing with respect to this question is that it says evaluate whether Totag has created a value. So that means you would have to calculate the EVA and the difficulty is using EVA. So you would have to identify the problems or the limitations of using EVA as a performance measure. So there are two things that you have to do. One of them is you have to identify whether Totag has created value or not. And the second thing is the difficulties of using EVA as a performance measure. So let's talk. Um, this is the relevant portion of the question. It says directors are unsure of suitable performance indicator for them to use to measure whether Totag is creating value. As an illustration, they have asked you to evaluate by calculating economic value added. Whether Totag has generated value or not, you should use the financial information given uh, in the appendix two. You should use the financial information given in the appendix two. Now, so the appendix two is here. We need to calculate. We need to calculate uh, the EVA uh, using this information. Can you just do the quick calculation? I'm just waiting for you people for two minutes. Can you just do the quick calculation, please? Uh, Madhuri, don't worry. I'll just go on to the VBM. Just don't worry. I'll explain the entire value based management. You don't have to worry at all. You don't have to worry at all, please.
Okay, now, um, so if I calculate the economic value added, uh, I've been given the operating profit, which is 10,000, the entrance expense, 1,500, the profit before tax, the tax at so-and-so, the profit after tax. Now the notes, it says that during the year, 450,000 of advertising cost, which will generate sales in future period was expense to the income statement. So if I try to calculate the NOPAT, I could do the NOPAT calculations like this also. Um, what exactly are going to be the way? You would say profit after tax, double six three zero. And with the profit after tax, you would say what? You would add up after tax interest. Uh, the 1500 interest multiplied by one minus T, one minus 0.22. So if you would add up the after tax interest, what is it going to be? It's 1500 multiplied by one minus 0.22. So it's actually going to be double one seven zero. Now, in addition to this, what is actually going to happen is, so we've got the profit after tax, then it's actually the after tax interest which needs to be added back. Furthermore, what happens is there is going to be the advertising cost of 450 which needs to be added back. Then what actually happens is it has to be, it has to be allowance for doubtful debts at the end of the period was this, a reduction of 200,000 from the beginning of the period. So if there is a reduction of 200,000, so this is actually an income that has been recorded. So what we need to do is that we need to remove it because it's an income that has been recorded. Capital employed at the beginning, we'll see that the after tax weighted average cost of capital was this, 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 companies financed by this, 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 Directors are considering changing policy to depreciation for the year ending so and so on. Now, on the basis of available information, let me repeat that on the basis of available information, this is what our no pad is. Let me repeat on the basis of available information, this is what our no pad is. Now, what exactly is this no pad? Let's try to have an understanding. Okay, it's actually going to be what? 6630, add 1170, add 450, less 200. So how much is it? 8050. Okay, it's 8050. We are adding interest. Okay, there is a question that why are we adding interest? Let me explain to you. Uh, just wait a minute, just wait a minute, please. Um, can we also do the calculation for the capital employed? So the beginning capital is double eight nine double four because we are working in terms of thousands. It's double eight double it's double eight nine double four. Then what happens is <clears throat> you need to perform the adjustments. This advertising cost is for the current year. We had an allowance. At the end of the period was 500,000 reduction of 200,000. So if you talk about the provision for bad debt, what was the opening provision? We have a closing provision of 300,000. There was a reduction of 200, so that means there was 500 at the opening. So 500,000 is the provision for bad debt that was existing. Uh, resultingly, what happens is it's double eight nine double four plus 500. What is it going to be? Double eight, nine, double four, plus 500. So hence resultingly what happens is it is 89, triple four. What is it going to be? It's going to be 89, triple four.
Okay. Now, so how exactly are we going to be calculating the economic value added? It's going to be it's going to be eight zero five zero less eighty nine thousand triple four multiplied by the VAC, which is nine percent. So hence, what happens is eighty nine thousand triple four into nine percent. Hence, eighty nine four 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 multiplied by nine percent. So if you say eight zero five zero less eighty nine four 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 into this, so it's zero point zero four. So if you try to establish the economic value added, this is what you have got. If you try to establish the economic value added, this is what you have got. Is that okay? Now, yeah, provision for bed debt is being added because it was previously deducted and it's non-cash. Yes, the opening one is to be added up. Okay, now there's a student who is asking that why have you why have you added back interest? So let me actually explain to you. Now, see what happens is when you calculate the net present value, how do we establish NPV? How do we establish NPV? When we are establishing the net present value, so how do we calculate? We use the cash flows and the cash flows are multiplied by the discount factor, so you end up getting PV. And when we are calculating the cash flows, we don't deduct interest in that. Why? Can you tell me the reason why? Yeah, can you tell me the reason why? Uh, Tenda Mopande, can you tell me the reason why? Why don't we deduct interest in the e, in the NPV calculation, please? Due to present value of what? I mean, Miss uh, this Tenda Mopande, can I have your answer? Okay, let me explain to you. Few of you have answered it correctly. We don't consider interest because we don't consider interest because the discount factor, which is the weighted average cost of capital, already includes the effect of interest, already includes the effect of the cost of equity. That's what it already includes. So the same concept, the same concept is applicable in the economic value added also. Now, what is that same concept? Here, what happens is this is the weighted average cost of capital that we are incorporating. We are saying the profit less the capital multiplied by the weighted average cost of capital. So if you have got the profit multiplied by the weighted average cost of capital, so that means you are already incorporating the effect of interest here. So if there is any effect of interest here, that needs to be removed. If there is any effect of interest that is prevalent over there, that needs to be removed. Yeah. 
या एस आर डो के ओके ग्रेट नाउ सो वी हैव नाउ थैंक यू अमृता now we have now got the economic value added which is 0.04 and the requirement was that you have to advise evaluate whether totec has created value and the difficulties of using ev as a performance indicator now when it has created value or not so yes it has created value the difficulties of using ev as a performance indicator i am not going to spend time on it it's a theoretical aspect it's available in the technical article that i shared with you a bit a while ago so you can get access to it over there also so i don't think that i need to go through it because it's 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 there like the problems the challenges etc so you can actually look at it from here i'm not going to go through it uh, the reason being that it's going to then end up taking a lot of time of us so now the next requirement is it says advise the directors on the implementation of a step 2 of the value based management as requested one of the students amongst your you people actually commented that the value based management is a very complicated topic so we would appreciate that if you could also explain the value based management so i am going to do that i am going to explain to you the value based management uh, that what exactly the value based management is all about so for that what i would want you people is to refer to this specific article also uh, when you would be going through at uh, your home when you would be wanting to read further uh, but what i am going to do is that i am going to explain to you the vbm right now that what exactly this vbm is okay now so if i talk about the concept of value based management let me explain to you that what exactly do we mean by this value based management uh when we talk about the value based management so you see value based management is a management technique value based management is a management technique which focuses upon value creation uh so value based management is a management technique which actually focuses upon the value creation now the first and the foremost important thing is what exactly do we mean by value so when we talk about the concept of value so the value actually means that the value is created when an entity generates returns over and above the returns desired by providers of finance so if i talk about the value based management i'm going to tell you that the value based management is a technique that focuses upon the value creation what it does is it focuses upon value creation and what exactly do we mean by value so let's say the value is created when an entity generates returns over and above the returns desired by the providers of finance now what exactly do we mean by this this means that if the entity is generating a positive npv that means it is creating value when it is generating the positive residual income it's generating value when it is generating the positive eva it is actually calculating the value why because these usually incorporate the return desired by the providers of finance 
Now what next is there? Yes, it's just like NPV. Now, so basically what happens is the value-based management is again, it's a technique where the focus is upon value creation. But when it comes to the creation of the value, so you need to understand that there has to be multiple measures of creating value. What are those multiple measures of creating value? So usually the value-based management uses economic value added. The value-based management uses the shareholder value analysis, SVA. The value-based management uses NVA. These two things are not part and parcel of the course. It's only the economic value added, which is part and parcel of the course. So first of all, you need to understand that EVA is a high level performance measure used in BBM. So when it comes to the value-based management in the EVA, the important thing is value-based management and EVA are not the same thing. EVA is part and parcel of value-based management. EVA is part and parcel of value-based management. So if you are applying, if you are implementing value-based management in any organization, that means EVA could be one of the ways of using it now. What's the next thing? Try to understand this. The next thing is, how does this value-based management leads to the creation of the value in any organization? So with respect to the value-based management, there is a four-step approach that a value-based management technique adopts in order to implement, in order to create value. What is this four-step approach? When I talk about the four-step approach, so the first thing is, the strategy producing a strategy so the first thing is strategy development the second thing is defining performance targets the third one of them is creating a plan to achieve the targets and the fourth one of them is setup of the performance measurement and the reward system now try to understand this thing that how the economic value added how this value-based management would be implemented in any organization so let's try to understand this. For example, the strategy is maximize shareholder wealth. Sorry, this is the overall objective that maximizing the shareholder object wealth. Now, if the shareholder wealth has to be maximized, so what is going to be the strategy, which is the course of action, which is going to be adopted in order to achieve this specific strategy. So assume that the entity may actually say that reduce cost of production per unit. Reduce cost of production per unit. Now, if this is one of the ways which is reducing the cost of production per unit, so this is the first step. What? It's the development of the strategy. Now, what is the second step? The second step is basically you have to set the performance target. So if you have to set the performance target, then what actually happens with respect to the setting of the performance target is maybe you could say that reduce cost by 20% in three years. So that's actually the performance target. The third one is this plan to achieve the target. Now, the plan to achieve the target, how exactly would you be able to reduce the cost by 20% in three years? So maybe, what you could do is that you could think about alternate material. You could think about training employees. You could think about the efficient machine. You could think about the waste recycling. So these could be the multiple things which are going to ultimately lead to reduction in the cost. And the fourth step is going to be the performance measurement. 
the fourth step is going to be the performance measurement and when we are going to be talking about the performance measurement so you would actually be introducing a measure for this you would be introducing a measure for this you would be introducing a measure for this a measure for this a measure for this so if you actually look at this value based management the objective is value creation but the approach is more or less similar to that of a balance score card or the performance pyramid because usually what happens is the performance pyramid what happens is we consider the operational level we consider the tactical level we consider the strategic level we know that this this is going to perform this will benefit if this will benefit this will benefit same thing happens with the value based management you perform at this level this performance is reflected here and this performance is reflected here so ultimately the value based management would would have an ultimate value creation as a objective as a thing but then again it could focus on both the financial and the non financial aspects okay there is a question that can you please give an example of how would you measure the waste materials and the training of employees so the training of employees could be the number of training hours then at the same time it could also be the time taken to produce an item the abnormal loss could be measured that how much was the abnormal loss percentage earlier and what is the abnormal loss percentage now wastage could be customer returns also yes uh, tender you are right so i hope that you people are able to understand the value based management now mazali is it okay now mazali is it okay now yeah is it okay now ah uh, well the activity based management is something else just wait for it for tomorrow probably okay now so this is how the economic uh, this is how the value based management is implemented now let's move a bit forward and discuss further the requirement was advise the director on the implementation of a step 2 so it says to tag manufacturers high quality and innovative small electrical appliances such as hair dryers and vacuum cleaners so what does to tag does it manufactures high quality and innovative small electric devices and so on and so forth now it says all of the board of directors who are the strategic decision makers have always worked in the business and are members of the totac family most of the operational managers joined as a factory workers when the business started 
and have taken on more responsibility as the business has grown. Prodeg has a basic and an outdated IT system for business of its complexity and has always used traditional financial performance measure such as the return on investment and the operating profit margin. So what they have done is they have majorly used the return on investment and the operating uh, profit margin. Now, it says today Prodeg has historically had few competitors. And the directors have focused on improving financial results from one year to the next. So what does it tell you? It says that Okay, it says that uh, a number of overseas competitors have however recently entered into TOTAG's market. It is estimated that within one year, these competitors will be able to produce at a similar unit cost to TOTAG and that within three to five years, the quality, within the three to five years, the quality of the competitor's products, the quality of the competitor's products will be comparable to the current quality of TOTAG's products. Now, what next is there? It says Totec may have to invest heavily in product development and make acquisitions in the future in order to uh, com compete effectively. So they have not had competition, but they are now going to have the competition. They are now going to have the competition. Now, what actually happens is it says a consultant has recently told the directors that implementing VBM may help Totec to respond to increase in competition over the next one to five years. Consultant has defined VBM as the alignment of business strategy, management processes, and culture on maximizing shareholder level by focusing on key drivers of value. Directors have estimate, accepted this as a reasonable definition of VBM, and most of them now agree that VBM would be useful, though others are not yet convinced. The others are not yet convinced. Now, what else does it say? It says that it says that directors will ask you for further advice on one aspect of implementation of VBM at Totec at a recent presentation. Consultant presented a slide showing the four steps. Directors want your advice on how to implement step two, which is defining performance targets. Your advice should focus on following areas. Selection of appropriate measures and targets, time scales to which the target should relate, management levels, operation in which the target should relate, and difficulties in measuring and management performance using VBM. So it's actually more of a, what they want is, they want that uh, we produce the answer with respect to defining of the performance targets, Depending on the performance target with respect to the selection of measures and targets, time scales, management levels, so and so, so forth. Now, you need to try and understand this thing that what is actually going to happen in this specific question. Okay, now, uh, the first thing is, uh, firstly, what happens is selection of appropriate measures and targets. So first thing is, you need to tell them that, look, 
your targets have to be financial and non financial both the second thing is are the return on investment and the operating profit margin <clears throat> they are probably outdated they are of no use you should rather focus upon you should rather focus upon cost reduction and at the same time you should have target which measure the quality also because you got just can't go on reducing the cost so basically the financial and non financial aspects plus cost reduction and quality these are the things they must be considered the next thing is what should be the time scale uh, always remember short term and long term targets need to be set like maybe possible for example there could be short term and the long term targets both need to be set Now what exactly do mean by this let's try to understand this basically this would mean that since there is a one year target there is a three year target there is a five year target all of these targets need to be set all of these targets need to be set um furthermore it says the management level of the business to which the target should relate ideally speaking it has to be the all levels of management because it's the operational then the tactical and then the strategic level goals because it has to be here it has to be here and it has to be here all three levels across the organization should be set the target difficulty in measuring and managing performance using vbm it's basically uh, the first problem is about the information system the lack of understanding and experience that the management may possess a lot of eva related issues like vac economic depreciation etc etc they could be the different type of things that need to be used vac economic depreciation etc etc so when the examiner is asking us that what could be the difficulties in implementing this step 2 so the difficulties in implementing this step 2 could arise from these various aspects Yeah, is that okay to everyone? okay great so we are going to answer this specific question like this
Could you please be more specific in relation to difficulties for each of these accepting the reluctance to change and the level of complexity for EVA? Uh, well, okay. Now, because also this value-based management would need you to have a good information system which could capture all the information and report to you. Unfortunately, you don't have a proper system. You have an outdated IT system. You have an outdated IT system. You don't have a proper system, unfortunately. Is that okay now? Okay, great. <coughs> so we are done with this question. We have covered up <coughs> value-based management. And we have also covered up the, um, we have also covered up the um, economic value added. And I believe that um, you people would have um got much confidence with respect to this area because eva is generally one of those areas where a lot of students they struggle they have problems in uh, tackling the eva uh Amma Mensa, thank you very much for your comments um so um we are probably heading into the final day of this session tomorrow but you don't have to worry because my support is going to continue with you people and i'm going to help continue to help you people prepare uh, for the exam and inshallah as much as i can help you uh, till the last day of the exam and uh, you will be getting my support inshallah to the maximum possible extent um for those of you who haven't joined in the whatsapp group you can join the whatsapp group or maybe you could message me on this number. And I am going to uh, get you added to the WhatsApp group. So basically, uh, that's it from my side. I really um, thank you very much, all of you. Would really appreciate to have feedbacks from you. If you could share your feedback of today's session and also any further suggestions. Uh, Yeah, I would really appreciate if you could share your feedback of today's session and the further suggestions for um, the subsequent session and etc. Uh, no worries, Asad Bharaj. They are all going to be uploaded uh, so you can view them. Um, Amrita, thank you very much. Uh, Tendai, uh, okay, you can get in touch with me. Uh, uh, good enough, uh, Ramiz, Alhamdulillah. So, um, uh, that's it for today. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time. Thank you very much for being uh, here. Uh, really appreciate uh, that you people take out time because ACCA has taken the initiative. Um, and it's it's actually for you people. And it's uh, like that. That's why they're making the recordings available to you also so that you can always uh, look at them. Uh, the plan for tomorrow is going to be a mixture of some divisionalization, some transfer pricing, some uh, activity-based management, something like that. 
so uh, we're going to continue inshallah tomorrow there are a few more things that need to be covered up you don't have to worry further i'll cover them up inshallah in the coming sessions so thanks a lot for time uh, thank you very much uh, see you tomorrow inshallah Thank you.